Maddie and the Cupid Killer by Farida Abdelaziz Part 3 Maddie got accustomed to a simple life by himself, structured with a quiet routine. His days as a detective were chaotic enough. He couldn't possibly cope with a social life, let alone a life partner. All he knew was to solve crimes, and catching criminals was his only reward in life. Many said it was unhealthy, chasing shadows, they said, then drinking at home in an isolated world of booze and nightmares. But it was his strange comfort zone he went home to every night. Their father, a then young policeman, was shot on duty, leaving Maddie the young man of the family, as his father would say. They never caught his father's killer, and he grew up with this obsession that somewhere out there, that man was still roaming the streets, free. So, he did what he thought was best. He became a policeman. To his surprise, this obsession was fruitful, since he began to solve crime after crime, lifting him up to the status of detective. Now six years after his promotion, he had a serial killer on the loose. And last night, the killer struck again. An early leak to the press got the murder baptized as the Cupid Killer, as his victims were mostly married younger women. He turned the keys to his front door and walked in as he hung his jacket on his wooden coat hanger near the door, turning on the lights in one motion. Endless evidence pictures were the sole pieces of art hanging on his wall now. His house was simply furnished, with only essential things, efficient and basic. He put his gun on the kitchen table, then dug up a boxed meal from the freezer. As his ready-made spaghetti carbonara slowly twirled in his microwave, he poured himself a generous amount of bourbon and sipped it, waiting for the beep. When the five-minute beep chimed, he took the plate out and sat at his dinner table, still thinking of that poor woman, laying in the streets, lifeless. He had positioned his table in front of an empty white wall. He had slowly filled with violent evidence pictures and clips from newspapers. Much like a television, he watched and analyzed every night. A never-ending show. His eyes went from one murder scene to another. Cupid had added a clothing item to each one, including the coat on Mrs. Swinton. He knew he was missing something, and he couldn't put his finger on it. He was now looking at the victim's curricula vitarum, as he was about to take the last bite of his now-called meal when it hit him. He jumped on his phone and dialed Callahan's number. When he got connected... He could hear loud music and a group of drunken men singing in unison. He looked at his watch. 11.37 p.m. Cal, at some point or another, they all worked at Maison Sylvain, the dress shop. They're exactly 23 days apart. He's going to kill again tomorrow. He finally managed to say. There was a long silence at the other end of the line. Then Callahan muttered before he hung up. Ah, shit. I'm picking you up in five. Maddie could taste blood on his lips now. As he looked at his reflection in the mirror hung next to him, he realized he bit it so hard, he had torn his lower lip. As he jumped in Callahan's car ten minutes later, he opened the file he had clenched in his tight fist. He dressed every victim with an item of clothing after he killed them. All killed with scissors. All worked at that fashion house. All his additions were the same style, same size 12. I think they belonged to his mother. We checked the coat and did a background check on the place, but not who works there or has worked there in the past. Finally, a lead. After a moment, Callahan was still in shock. God damn it! We got that son of a bitch. But Maddie shook his head. Not yet.